Hello, and welcome to Music Stuff with Spock. Today we're going to look at my uh, most recent compositional fishing expedition, uh, uh, which is similar to a woodshedding session that performers would have. They'll hold themselves up in the studio for days or weeks, sometimes months at a time, to work on particular aspects of their playing to get better. With a composer, in a fishing expedition, what we do is we sit in the studio for days or weeks at a time and come up with a whole bunch of ideas to come up with musical material to use for future pieces. For me, I had recently broken my arm in two places and I was out of playing or writing or doing anything musical for a few months. So I did this to kick myself, kickstart myself back into writing again. This most recent fishing expedition, I was looking at the tone row that Alban Berg used in his violin concerto. Uh, this started after an orchestration lesson where I played part of that piece, and then later on that night I listened to the whole piece and looked at the score and then looked up a few things online about the piece. Now, Alban Berg uses a tone row, and for those of you who do not know what a tone row is, it's an organizational method uh, to write chromatic music. What we do is we take all 12 of the chromatic semitone and we put them in a particular order. And then once we've set that order, we use that row um, sort of like a scale. And we write pieces with it. We make chords out of it. We use it for the melodies. You can manipulate the row by playing it upside down, playing it backwards, playing it backwards and upside down, and transposing it to any one of the 12 chromatic semitones. And the point is to play it from beginning to the end before you do one of these manipulations so that you always have all 12 chromatic semitones circling so that you never get that restful feeling of a tonic. Now, one of the interesting things about Album Berg and his use of the row is that he purposely composed rows that had tonal references. So most people use the 12 tone row to write fairly aggressive dissonant music, but he used it to write music that implied tonality but it constantly shifted. So I took a look at that row and uh, did a brief analysis of it and came up with a whole bunch of ideas. Now, the, one of the purposes of a compositional fishing expedition is not to write a specific tune. It's to come up with a whole bunch of different ideas that can be used in different tunes. So I manipulated this row and, and, and made chord progressions out of it and used it for melodies to write uh, a whole bunch of different little sketches uh, in various styles that will eventually turn into other pieces. Now, while you do this, invariably you'll come up with a melody and a chord progression and that'll come to another one and you'll end up with sections of tunes. But the point is not to finish the tune, just to come up with enough of a section that, oh, okay, there's the beginning of the tune, and then you go on to something else. And you see how many of these things you can come up with, and then when it's all done, you can pick and choose which ones you like, and if you don't like any of them, then at least you've got the whole process going. So let's take a look at some of the stuff I've been doing over the last couple of weeks. The first thing I did was to write out the row and do a brief analysis. Now when you look at it, it's entirely constructed out of thirds and seconds. And when you stack the notes up on top of each other, they construct chords. So I did a brief harmonic analysis of the different chord possibilities you can get. This shows the various triads you can get, and some of the extensions to make four-part chords. And this divides the chords up between the stable triads and the non-stable triads. There are four standard transformations of a row. You can present the row in its original form. You can make an inversion of all the intervals, and that's called the inversion of the row. When you write the row backwards, it's called the retrograde, and finally there's the retrograde inverted. I tried playing the chords one after another, but going up in thirds is very sucky root movement. So, if you notice, every other note in the row goes up in fifths, and perfect fifth is very strong root movement. So I wrote out every other chord and came up with this particular progression of chords. And after that, I added all the extensions and came up with these complicated, jazzy kind of chords that moved from one to the other. And I look for guide tone lines. 
And then I wrote out some of those lines and recorded a few of them. And then I tried a few different instruments playing the melody and a few variations with the orchestration. If you look at groups of five notes in this row, you get various five-part chords, or what is known as ninth chords. The first five notes outline what is known as a G minor major 9, a G minor triad with a major 7 and a major ninth above that. Notes 5 through 9 outline an A minor major 9. The last five notes of the row outline five of the six notes in the B whole tone scale, but there is no seventh. So if you write chords with these notes, it'll sound more like polychords than a true ninth chord. So I spent the next few days writing out various lines, chords, and progressions, and orchestrating and recording a few.
Here's a little look at what I've been up to the last couple of weeks. I've come up with a number of lines, a number of textures, and sections for several different tunes, which I'll work on over the next few months. There's nothing wrong with taking inspiration from other people's pieces, as long as you're not copying their notes directly and calling them your own. See you soon.